rest of us open up our Bibles or navigate our electronic devices to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25. We're going to pick up where we left off last week in verse 14. And Lord willing, we're going to cover verses 14 through 46, where we read Matthew chapter 25, beginning with verse 14. For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. And to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to each according to his own ability. And immediately he went on a journey. Then he had received the five talents, went and traded with them, and made another five talents. And likewise he who had received two gained two more also. But he who received one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his Lord's money. Now after a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. So he who had received five talents came and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, You delivered to me five talents. Look, I have gained five more talents besides them. And his Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. And he who had received two talents came and said, Lord, you delivered to me two talents. Look, I have gained two more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Well, then he who had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown, gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid. And I went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, there you have what is yours. But his Lord answered and said to him, You wicked and lazy servant. You knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. So you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers. And at my coming, I would have received back my own with interest. Therefore, take the talent from him and give it to him who has ten talents. For to everyone who has, more will be given, and he will have abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now when the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory, and all the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. He will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, you gave me food. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was a stranger, you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Well, then the righteous will answer him, saying, Well, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick Or in prison and come to you. The king will answer and say to them, Assuredly I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these my brethren, you did it to me. Then he will also say to those on his left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, you gave me no food. I was thirsty, you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, you did not take me in. Naked, you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer him, saying, Well, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Now, the message this morning is entitled, Indwelled, Invested, and Involved, Part 2. Guess what last week's study was entitled? Part 1. There you go. Now, both Matthew chapters 24 and 25 record for us what is called the Olivet Discourse, 
where Jesus answered the disciples' questions regarding the end times as he, Jesus, was sitting on the Mount of Olives. Look back at chapter 24, verse 3, if you please. Matthew 24, verse 3. Now, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, and that's why all those brilliant Bible theologians of the past call this the Olivet Discourse, the Olivet Discussion. Um, Geniuses they were. Uh, They sat on the Mount of Olives. The disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Well, Jesus then began to tell the disciples that signs leading up to the end would include wars, rumors of wars, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, false Christs, and false prophets. In other words, what you see on the news every night. Jesus also spoke of, in these uh, chapters, the rapture of the church, the revealing of the Antichrist, the Antichrist then committing the abomination of desolation, the battle of Armageddon, the return of Jesus Christ with his church to establish his kingdom on the earth, and the gathering of Jewish believers to join up with us, plus many other exciting events. And if you want to get our uh, CD, audio CDs of the last few Bible studies after service, you can see Mike Bennett. We did a three-part series on Matthew 24, and now a two-part series here on Matthew chapter 25. But in all of these things that Jesus spoke about, the overlying, the, the underlying, whatever you want to call it, the tenure, the focus of what he talked about was this. Church, be ready for the master's coming. Church, be ready and expecting the master's return. Look at chapter 24, verse 42. Watch, therefore, this is what Jesus is saying, the therefore, summarizing all of the things that he's saying. What should we do? He says, watch, therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. Jesus told the parable of the wise and also the wicked servant. The wise expected his master to return at any moment, and therefore he was faithful to his Lord and also was ministering to the fellow servants. The wicked servant, however assumed his master had delayed his return, and therefore he behaved abusively and carnally. Look at verse 50 of chapter 24 where Jesus warns, the master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him and in an hour that he is not aware of and will cut him in two. That can't be pleasant. Cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then we came to chapter 25. We began it last week where Jesus tells three parables to emphasize this point that not only must we know that his return is near, but secondly, that we also live our lives accordingly. Knowledge without putting it into practice is worthless. It's like that faith without works is dead that the Apostle James talks about. Yes, we must know biblical truth, but if it doesn't move us to a changed life, then what good is it? What good is it? And so the the, the focus of these three parables here in chapter 25 is, in light of the fact that Jesus is returning soon, here's what you ought to do. The first parable tells us that we become indwelled with the Holy Spirit. We've got to make sure that we're saved and that the Holy Spirit is dwelling within us. The second parable tells us that we have got to invest our lives in God's kingdom. Not in our own, not in our own personal, private, what we hope to do, but in God's kingdom. And thirdly, the third parable that we get involved serving others in need just as if we were serving Jesus himself. And in all these three, with a sense of urgency... A sense of we got to get her done right now because Jesus could come back at any moment. Now, last week we covered verses 1 through 13, the parable of the ten virgins or the ten bridesmaids. Five were wise, for they had oil in their lamps. Five were foolish because they had lamps, but no oil. What good is a lamp without oil? It's worthless. It's a little decoration, but who cares? The purpose of a lamp is to do what? Give light, that's right. And without oil, there's no light. And then finally the trumpet sounded 
to announce that the wedding was about to begin and the foolish ones had to hurry off to try to buy oil, but for them it was too late. The wise went in and the foolish ones were then shut out. The fools suffered the consequences of their foolishness. They did not have oil. And as we talked about last week, oil represents the Holy Spirit. There in Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6, Not by might nor by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord. And the Holy Spirit dwells within us when we receive Jesus as our Savior and Lord. There are a lot of churchgoers, a lot of people who play the part. They look Christian. They speak Christianese. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. God bless you. Or, I'll pray for you. Then they never do. No, anyway. Though... There are many who look the part, sound like it, but they've never asked Jesus to truly be the Lord of their lives. Their lives really aren't changed. In fact, on Sunday, they're one way. The rest of the week, they're another. The rest of the week, they're different. They're, They're like their real selves at that point. The fools were shut out. They had no oil. Do you have oil? Are you indwelled by the Holy Spirit? Are you sure? Because in Matthew chapter 25, verse 13, at the end of that parable we read last week, Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. Do not be like the foolish person who said, Well, you know, know, I'll accept Jesus someday, but right now I have too much living to do. Do you know who said that, by the way? Those very words. My brother-in-law's father was an executive for Hertz Rent-A-Car. And he used to play golf with executives and celebrities. One of the celebrity endorsers for Hertz rent a car at one time, the guy used to run through the airport and stuff. Remember him? O.J. Simpson? So my brother-in-law's father was talking to O.J. on the golf course years and years ago and was witnessing to him. And O.J. said, yeah, 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 I know. My friends and and all my teams and all, some of them are believers. But I'm just not ready. I got too much living to do. And then Guy Warner said to O.J., well, what if your life comes to a screeching halt? What are you going to do then? And do you know when Guy Warner told me those words? When we were watching the Ford, white Ford Bronco being followed by dozens of police officers. Man, you can't make stuff up like that, folks. You cannot just conjure up things like that. True story. True story. Don't be like the fool. Yeah, I'll get to it by and by. No. You make sure today, make sure your lamp, your life, is indwelled by the Holy Spirit. The main point of that parable as well as the next two parables is we have got to be watchful and ready and doing what we need to do in light of the fact that Jesus is coming soon. In verses 14 through 30, we read, invest or die. Invest or die. It's a matter of life and death. Literally, spiritually. Verse 14. For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country. By the way, the man in this parable is representative of Jesus himself. The far country that he's traveling far away to for a time is, you tell me, heaven. That's right. So the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who, before he left, he called his own servants and delivered goods to them. To one he gave five talents. A talent, by the way, is not necessarily, at least not in this context, an ability. It's not some God-given or even a spiritual gift. A talent is a weight of measurement. Typically a talent of silver, a talent of gold, like a pound of silver, a pound of gold. And so to one he gave five talents. Weights, five measurements of uh, to the one, and to another two, and to another one, each according to his own ability. And immediately he went on a journey. And so, very much like what Jesus did with the disciples, just before he ascended into heaven, Jesus gave his disciples a command, but then he also gave them the means, the talents, so to speak, to fulfill. That command, and it's found in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Jesus said to the disciples just before he ascended into heaven, You shall receive power, dunamis, where we get our, our English word dynamite from. You'll receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. This is speaking of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. 
So one of the many talents that God has invested in us is the Holy Spirit. We receive power when we receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. When you first believe in Jesus, he comes to dwell within. But then there's a second experience a believer can have with the Holy Spirit, and that's the upon or the epi experience, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, if you, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Father give the Holy Spirit to him who asks? And so to receive the baptism of the Spirit, you simply need to ask. In the book of Acts, we read in some places where uh, the Apostle Paul laid hands on some believers and then they received the baptism of the Spirit. You might want somebody to pray for you, to lay hands on you, to receive the baptism of the Spirit, then to receive the gifts of the Spirit. After the service this morning, if you want the baptism of the Spirit, if you're already indwelled, but you haven't yet had the upon experience, after the service, we'll be happy to lay hands on you and pray for you. So this is what Jesus has invested in us. He tells us to be filled with, to be baptized with, anointed with the Holy Spirit so that we can be effective, powerful witnesses for him in this world. Now, he's invested this in us. And upon his return, Jesus expects a return on his investment. Jesus has an accounting system. I don't know exactly how it is. I don't know how he's going to work it out, but I do know this. He has invested his spirit, and he has invested many God-given talents and abilities. He's invested many things in each one of us, and he expects a return, a spiritual return on his investment When he comes back. So right now, as the Bible says, let a man examine himself. Right now it's time for us to examine ourselves. Are we producing spiritually? Are we really producing spiritually? Is the Lord getting a good return on his investment? Verse 16. The one who had received the five talents went and traded with them and also made another five. He doubled his master's investment. And likewise, he who had received two gained two more also. So he also doubled his master's investment. But he who had received one went and dug in the ground and hid his Lord's money. Why do you do that? Why would you do that? Fear? Too busy? I don't have time to go. I got, I got too much I, I got to do. I'm too busy at work. I'm too busy at school. I'm too busy doing this and that. Maybe it's just pure selfishness. What good reason do you think the Lord would accept for this servant to bury the talent God has invested in him? That's a good question, isn't it? God's invested something in you. If you're not using it for his glory, if you have buried it for some reason and you're just living for yourself, you're going to stand before the Lord one day. What will you tell him where he'll say, oh, okay, never mind then. I see your point. Will anybody be able to convince God that it was okay to not serve him? Will anybody be able to say to the Lord on that day, But Lord, I was too busy. Oh, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry I asked you then. <laughs> Forgive me for burdening you with an opportunity to serve me and therefore lay up treasures in heaven. What's the Lord going to say? Why did this man bury what God entrusted him? Here's the three reasons why Jesus says that people are unfruitful. The cares of this world, all concerned about what's going on. We, you know, I can't serve the Lord. I've got to make a little extra money so I can hoard more bullets in my basement. The deceitfulness of riches. Oh, I, I, I'll serve the Lord after I get this amount of money. And then well, once you get that, well, that, that's not enough. I need more money. I'll do it when I get more money. Deceitful. Can you ever have enough? I believe it was John Paul Getty years and years and years ago. There was a multimillionaire and somebody asked him, why are you still working? And his answer was what? One more million. Just wanted one more million. The deceitfulness of riches and 
Bottom line, desire for other things. I see so many people in the body of Christ that desire so many other things, okay things, even for our children, and we put them into activities and things, but man, the word of God is being choked out. And we are unfruitful. Our kids are unfruitful because we have them and we have ourselves so busy with things that in eternity are going to matter zip. Not going to matter a bit. And all the while, we have friends and family and neighbors who are dying and going to hell. But, oh, hey, little, little Billy's doing really well in soccer. It's okay. Yeah, they went to hell. But little Susie, man, she is really tearing it up on the clarinet. Now, it's nothing wrong to have our kids involved in these things. But when it is so much that the Lord isn't being served... And we're burying these talents in other things. You're not going to answer to me. I'm going to answer to the Lord. And you're going to answer to the Lord. For what we do. With what God has entrusted to us. Ask yourself a question. Is what we have our kids involved with. Something that can be redeemed spiritually. Is there a spiritual component to it? If there is, great. If your kids are involved in in sports, and they're inviting their friends to the youth group, inviting their friends to church, and other families are coming. Praise the Lord. That's a ministry. Go for it. But are they doing that? Are you doing that? Are you talking to the other parents? And you yourselves, hobbies. What hobbies do we have? And look, I'm guilty too. I got hobbies. But I'll be the first to say, when I'm in the deer stand, I'm praying. And I got my cool little phone where I have my... I have edited Bible studies and prepared them for Sunday morning sermons. And by the way, when I pray in the deer stand, it's not just, Lord, bring a big deer by, would you please? I pray for you and and other things. Redeeming the time, that's what it's all... Is it spiritual? Because whatever's flesh is going to burn away. And there are a lot of busy people who in heaven are going to have nothing to show for it. Because all that stuff, wood, hay, and straw, just going to burn away and be gone. Are you investing your God-given talents into furthering his kingdom? Remember, accounting day is coming. Verse 19. So after a long time, and it's been 2,000 years since Jesus has left. Long time is up. He's coming back soon. After a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. So he received the five talents, came and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I have gained five more talents besides them. And by the way, it just came to my mind. (laughs) Scary when stuff like that happens, right? The ladies who are sewing on Friday to make bags for the homeless, that's redeeming a talent. For the kingdom of heaven. That's something a person can do. Practical thing. Taking what you can do and using it for God's glory. Simple thing like sowing. Simple thing. So the guy who had five talents came and brought five other talents saying, and he's all excited. Look, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. And look, I've gained five more talents besides them. And he gave all the ten over. And his Lord said to him, oh, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful. Notice that word faithful. Underline it. That's what it's all about. Faithfulness. To serve God with what he's entrusted you. Faithfulness. Well done, good and faithful servant. You're faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Your faithfulness in spiritual things on this side of eternity has a one-to-one correlation with what God will have you do on the other. Faithful in little things, ruler over much. Faithfulness here, somehow, someway, a better position there. All heaven is good, but some are a little more gooder, I guess. Faithful in a few things, ruler over much. Enter into the joy of your Lord. You're in. 
He would also received uh, two talents, came and said, Lord, you delivered to me two talents. Look, I have gained two more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Now, even though the first guy began with five and ended up with five more, ten in all, though we had more than the one guy who only ended up with four talents, ten to four, Yet the Lord rewarded them both for their faithfulness. Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. Faithful. Whether you feel you have a lot to offer the body of Christ or hardly anything, if anything, God rewards faithfulness. See, The world rewards success. We live in a success-driven world. The attitude, what have you done for me lately? Coach could win the Super Bowl last year, and if his team doesn't do well this year, he's fired. He's gone. What have you done for me lately? But in God's economy, value is not determined by our outcome. Value is determined by faithfulness. Let me repeat that. In God's economy, value is not determined by outcome. It's determined by faithfulness. We do what we're supposed to do, and whether it succeeds or it doesn't, that department is the Lord's. We read that one man plants, another man waters, but it is God who gives the increase. We need to be faithful to plant the Word of God in people's lives. We need to be able to, or need to be faithful to encourage people with the washing of the Word of God. But it's up to the Lord to make the change. We be faithful, and God will reward us in time. God has, and maybe you're today thinking, "I, I don't have anything to offer. I can't play guitar, can't carry a tune in the in a bucket." I break into cold sweats when I think about working with the children in the children's ministry, as some of you are right now. Right, Andrew? Right. And maybe you don't feel that you can do anything. You know, you hear we, we, we could use some help in the flower beds. You know, just anybody wants to come and, and plant stuff, you're welcome to do so. You think, well, I don't have a green thumb. I have a brown thumb. Whatever I plant dies. And, So that's just not your thing. But you know what? God has given to all of us a precious gift in equal amounts. And you know what that precious gift is that each one of us has received from the Lord? Time. Each one of us has the same 24 hours in a day, seven days a week, 52 weeks in a year. We all have the same amount of time. Now, we spend it very differently from one another, don't we? As Jesus' return draws nearer and nearer, we would be wise to spend our time denying ourselves and serving the Lord. We would be much better off pulling back from self-service and start investing our time into God's service. In Ephesians 5, we're told, see then that you walk circumspectly, which means extremely carefully. Hey, the world out there, it's a minefield. Navigate it carefully. Be careful out there. Walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. And here's how we're wise. Redeeming the time Because the days are evil. I mentioned earlier, if your kids are involved in sports, are you viewing that as a ministry opportunity? Are you praying with little Jimmy or Susie or Billy or LaFont Leroy or whoever, and you're saying, let's... That's a very old English word, by the way, LaFont Leroy. And you're saying to the kids, let's pray for the other kids you're playing with and against, and let's pray for the parents that they might see Jesus in us. Are you redeeming the time? Or is it, okay, Junior, I want you to get out there. I want you to crush them in Jesus' name, you know, or whatever. Are we redeeming the time? Apparently, the man that was given the one talent didn't feel it was in his best interest to invest his time with the talent God gave him. So he buried it. 
Notice in verse 20, 24. Then he who had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown, gathering where you have not scattered seed. Notice the opinion of this servant that he had of his Lord. He called him a hard man, an unscrupulous, miserly guy. But was his Lord, was really his Lord like that? Was that a really accurate description of his Lord? Or was a servant saying this to cover up his own wrongful behavior? Was he shifting the blame, thereby excusing his wrongful behavior? The man went on to say, and I was afraid. And I went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, there you have what is yours. It may be a little dirty, but at least you're getting back what you gave me. Was he really afraid? The Lord didn't think so. Was it that the, that the Lord was really tough and, and all and therefore fear should have gripped everybody's heart? No, that's not what the master said. Notice what the master said of the servant. You're afraid of me? No, you're not afraid of me. Notice in verse 26, his Lord said to him, You wicked and lazy servant. You knew where uh, I reap where I have not sown, gather where I have not scattered seed. So the man, the servant, blamed his master for being hard and ruthless. But the truth was that the servant was simply wicked and lazy. And as wicked and lazy people do, they often find others to blame for their own problems. It's not my fault. It's their fault. I didn't get her fair shake. And, uh, you know, they, they're the, and in fact, it's God. A lot of people blame God for their problems. It's like a person who takes a gun, shoots themselves in the foot, and then wants to, to sue the gun manufacturer or the bullet maker. You shot yourself in the foot. You have only yourself to blame. Oh, it can't be my fault. My psychiatrist said it wasn't my... Anyway, we'll go on from there. The most wicked and lazy people are, of all are those who blame God. Because you know what? God is never wrong. In Romans 3, we read, Let God be true, but every man a liar. So when a person tries to blame God, Lord, if it's the woman you gave me. That was Adam's response. Your fault, God, because you gave her to me. There's some couples who think, Yeah, God, it's your fault. You, you let me marry him or her. Really? These kids, if they were any better, God, you, why haven't you made them better? Really, that's God's fault. Let God be true. That every man a liar. Therefore, those who find fault with God are ultimately the faulty ones. He was wicked and lazy, according to his master. And really, it took more effort to bury the, the talent than to go to the bank and deposit it. You, and if God gives you something, there's at least something you can do for his kingdom. It may seem like a trivial, small thing, but there's something each of us can do, especially with the time that God has given to us. Notice in verse 27, so this is the master speaking to the wicked, lazy servant. So you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers. At my coming, I would have received back my own with interest. So even those who feel like they have nothing to offer can at least do one thing, something with their time that, by the way, is not just a little interest on your return. You take your money to the bank today. What's the, what's the interest return on a savings account? Barely over 1%. Something ridiculous, super small. 2% if you're lucky. What, anybody get better than that? What bank are you going to? <laughs> but what can we do with our time where we get an investment, even if it's a, a, nothing, just our time? What can we do with it and get an investment? Well, there's something we can do with our time that's important and it's vital and it is really, really fruitful. And you know what that is that we do with our time that has great benefit? Serving the Lord how? Pray. Prayer. Something all of us can do. We can all pray. We can all talk to God. To develop that daily prayer life. To come on Sunday nights to the prayer fellowship. Except tonight, which is our eating meeting, and that's at 6 o'clock. But normally Sunday nights is 6.30. 
And if you're free Thursday mornings, you can come at 8 o'clock where we have another prayer time. And if those times don't work out for you, then find a time once a week where you can take that time, redeem the time, and seek the Lord and pray specifically for Calvary Chapel Bartlett. If you call this church your church home, and I hope you do, I do. If this is your church home, then we have got to be praying for this fellowship to be an effective witness in this kingdom, in God's kingdom, to be a witness in this world. There is, I believe, a one-to-one correlation between God's people praying and fruitful ministry. If God's people will pray, the Lord promises he will bless, he will heal, he will restore, he will do great things. But if God's people aren't praying, I don't believe God's going to move. We've got to be a praying people. And we've got to specifically be praying for the ministry that God has entrusted to us. This church fellowship, this is a talent that God has entrusted to each of us. Are we investing his talent for his glory? And again, the one thing we can all do is pray. Got to, got to, got to pray. Especially because Jesus is coming back soon. We've got to redeem the time. We have family and friends who don't know the Lord. And they're going to die and go to hell. On our watch. They are going to die and go to hell on our watch. We have got to redeem the time. May we not squander the time that Jesus has entrusted to us. Notice that those who do squander their time will pay a huge price. Verse 28. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has ten talents. For to everyone who has more will be given. He will have an abundance. But from him who does not have even what he has will be taken away. You serve the Lord faithfully now and God is going to give you more. If you serve the Lord faithfully now with what he's entrusted to you, he will entrust you with more. It's just like at any job situation. You prove yourself a good employee, your employers will want to bless you with more work. And in God's kingdom, the more work is a good thing. It's a great, honorable thing because it translates itself into eternal reward. Now, Notice that the person who buried the talent, that talent eventually was put to good use. God will get his work done. Never feel like you are the savior of the church, savior of some ministry, savior of something. Never, ever, ever assume that if you don't do the work, the work will not get done. No. God's people are not indispensable. God's people, God can easily take one out and put in another. Very easily, God could fill anybody's spot. God's work is going to get done. And if one person won't do it, the Lord will raise up another and his work will be done. But woe to the person who is wicked and lazy and is burying what God entrusted them to do. Notice verse 30. Cast the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And bottom line, that cannot be a good thing. Can't be good. Now, I had hoped to get through the next part But I can see that according to the atomic clock, which is accurate, it's about time we wind up. Do you feel that you are investing your time, your talents, and your treasure into God's kingdom? Or have you taken what God has entrusted to you and you're just using them for yourself? To build up your own kingdom. Yes, family is a ministry. It's our first and foremost ministry. But there's more to serving the Lord than just making sure that our family's needs are taken care of. We've got to do more. And I'm, I'm 
not necessarily haunted, but I'm, I'm warned by the words of Jesus when he says, the cares of the world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desire for other things chokes out the word, and the person becomes unfruitful. Is the Holy Spirit speaking to anybody here this morning in regard to what you've done in the past and what you should be doing going forward? I love what 2 Corinthians 5 says, If anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away, all things become new. There's nothing we can do about the past. And to mourn over it and grieve over it and be upset at ourselves for not doing what we should have been doing, that's not going to do us a bit of good, will it? You can't unscramble an egg. You cannot go back and unsin a sin. Going forward, however, we absolutely can do something about that. Each one of us can make a new commitment this morning that from this point on, we are going to redeem the time. Our kids' soccer, our kids' band, our kids' whatever, my personal um, hunting, fishing, whatever, it's going to be used for God's glory, not mine. I'm going to somehow, some way, seek the Lord that I might redeem that time for glorious things. And I guess my question this morning to us is, who's willing to make that commitment? Who's willing to say, you know, the past, haven't been redeeming it so much, but going forward, I'm going to redeem the time. I want the Lord to make that real in my life. I want to be serious, especially in light of, of the fact that Jesus is coming back soon. I'm going to be a praying man. I'm going to be a praying woman. From this point on, I'm going to pray more. And I just want to know, is anybody, the Lord, as he says in his word, the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose hearts are loyal to him. I believe the Lord's calling out a people to redeem the time and to pray. And I believe the Lord is calling people from this fellowship to decide to redeem the time and pray. And so let's take a moment to pray. And let's ask the Lord to speak to our hearts. Father, we do want to lay ourselves open before you because everything is open and bare and naked before you. You see everything, God. And you, you see those who have wrongful Opinions of you, like the man who said that you were harsh and you were cruel, and Lord, such was not the case. Lord, you were anything but those things. You were loving, you were gracious, you were merciful, you were abounding in mercy. Your mercies are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Lord, your love, you are love, and you've loaded us with good things. You daily load us with benefits, but yet you expect us to use those benefits for your kingdom and your glory. And Lord, I pray that you would break through any self-focus. Break through any self-desires. Lord, any plans that we make that are really not in line with your will, that are certainly not ministry, but are just simply flesh. And God, I pray that you would show us and you would convince us that it's time to lay those things aside and it's time, high time, to redeem the time because truly the days we live in are evil. And Lord, I just believe you're speaking to, to people here this morning. You're wanting, Lord, to just confirm a new commitment in their lives that if they will meet you where you are, you will take them the rest of the way. And if we will make the stand... You will make it happen. And so while we're praying, if you feel the Lord is speaking to your heart, that you need to make a a new commitment to redeem the time. Going forward, you're going to redeem the time. If that's you, would you raise your hand up right now? God bless you all. God bless you all. The Lord sees and the Lord knows. And by that simple raising of the hand, that simple act of faith, God will meet you and minister to you right where you are. You can put your hands down. Yes, Lord, we, we want to be a praying people much more than we do. Lord, we want to seek your face much more than we do because we know, Lord, there is a one-to-one correlation between seeking your face and praying 
and fruitfulness. Lord, we want to be fruitful. We've got to be praying. So Lord, lead us in our prayer times. Carve out time for us, God. May we set aside things that don't matter in order that we might seek your face. And we just pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.